Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming back. Um, just to uh, let you know, hands up anybody that didn't come yesterday. Didn't come yet? Oh, lots. Okay, well, there you go. You're in for a treat today. Um, but also, yesterday, uh, if you want to, they've just started playing uh, yesterday's presentation on Channel 21. So if you can't get to sleep at night, you put it on 21 and <clears throat> you'll be gone in next to no time. Anyway, back to the job in hand. My name's John Hocknell, I'm a former patrol officer in Papua New Guinea. My charming wife Morag down there with the gorgeous blonde hair. <laughs> um, but we'll get on with it. Uh, this, is, this is basically, it's, this is a, a story of, of our amazing life. Uh, not just in Papua New Guinea, more I'll move on to areas outside of Papua New Guinea when she gets to make her presentation. But this is the, the job. I, I'm a qualified aircraft engineer and when we left the UK, went to Australia, and it was going to take forever to get a promotion with ANSET. Good job I didn't get a promotion with ANSET. Um, and um, I was reading the evening paper in, in uh, Melbourne, and this ad popped up. Get into a real man's job. I thought, like, yes, that sounds like me. Be a patrol officer in Papua New Guinea. And uh, one of the, the bits of the ad said, which you probably can't read, said, men of integrity, natural leaders who enjoy life and care about the people and things around them, wherever they are. They need to be alert and possess, initi possess initiative and um, not have false teeth and uh, no fear of physical effort. So those people that saw the presentation yesterday, the last slide of me, <laughs> that's my physical effort that was on display there. But anyway, patrol officer in Papua New Guinea. Patrol officers are also known as KIAPs. The word KIAP is a derivation of the German word KIAPTEN. New Guinea, German New Guinea at the top, first administration, most of the patrol, patrol officers were commissioned officers in the, uh, in the uh, German Navy. This is back in the, the 1800s. And uh, they were called Captain von Schmidt or Captain von Brunn or whatever it might have been. And um, so the Papua New Guineans uh, shortened their, their title to Kiap. In uh, Papua or um, British New Guinea, the bottom bit, um, we were known as patrol officers, but over time, uh, just amalgamated, uh, when Papua New Guinea became a complete country itself, the word Kiat became the term that was used for the work that we did. And um, there's the administration there was from, from 1910 right through to 1973, they had a thing called self-government, and that was supposed to lead into maybe five or eight years of self-government and then that would transfer into independence. But um, a guy called Michael Thomas Samari met up with a guy called Gough Whitlam and called him a colonialist. And Gough Whitlam didn't like that, so instantly they got shortened from 1973 to 1975 when Papua New Guinea became independent. Um, that isn't the uniform of the patrol officer that I'm wearing. Um, I have uh, an uncle who was in the Royal Air Force in Singapore, and this is the Royal Air Force tropical gear. So when he knew we were going to Papua New Guinea, we were up to him and he said, OK, I'll send you three, three shorts and three shirts, one off, one off, on and one in the wash, and that'll do you for the time you're there. And they did. So they were a beautiful uh, tailor-made um, Royal Air Force uh, tropical uniform. But, get your pens and paper out. Here's the duties that we carry out. Everybody take notes, please. Ah, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> we won't worry. But they're basically all of the activities that we had to get involved in in Papua New Guinea. There's dozens of them there. Um, but this, was, this is a little pictorial sketch of it. We wore many hats, top left hand side, Crocodile Farms, Economic Development, 
Below that, we were building roads. Below that, we were building bridges. Top right-hand side, we were doing uh, government administration. Then below the back is local government. And then we were policemen, magistrates, and jailers, all three, same time. Uh, we carried out elections. There's a lady casting her ballot. And uh, we got involved in community health requirements, everything from uh, building uh, pit latrines through to other aspects. And there's a death out of there. I'll tell you a little story about the death out part of the community health that we got involved in. But when we went up to Papua New Guinea, uh, we were first stationed in a place called Bogia, up there in the Madang province. And then we went to... So our contract was we did... 21 months on, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and three months off. So that's the that's the work that we did. So after every contract, and um, I got I got transferred to a different station every time. So we went from Bogia to Sidor, and then from Sidor we went up to Tari. Then on just before independence and on and through independence, I was up in a place called Como and then I went back to Tari again. So that's the, the, the various places that uh, we went. A lot of people say, oh, did you know Fred Bloggs or Mary Smith at such and such a place? Generally, the answer is no, because we were out in the middle of nowhere with very little contact with, with anybody else. However, I, uh, I was on patrol uh, anywhere between, from minimum of 15 days a month through to 70 days on longer patrols. And more, I've managed to score herself a little bit of work here and there, and she'll explain a bit more about that in her presentation. But this is what generally happened on patrol. We, had, we, we walked everywhere. All of our uh, equipment and everything went into these galvanized patrol boxes with a rubber seal around the top, so when they got dropped in the rivers, they, they didn't fill up with water. And um, that's one little patrol coming in from the Basavi. Here's another one, the guys carrying these patrol boxes on the on sticks. Now, we would have, depending on the length of the patrol we went on, anywhere between 20 and 100 carriers carrying the, the patrol gear. And um, generally, it, it took two, two carriers to carry the equipment and everything for one person, plus themselves. So you ended up having, you know, for three people to go on patrol, for one person to go on patrol, three people had to go on there. For those people that have lived in Papua New Guinea before, will recognize the type of food we ate. Oxen, palm, corned beef, uh, my, my uh, favorite or least favorite. Uh, we used to get uh, Tom Piper sausage, singular, and vegetables in a can. And there was a, um, a uh, um, mass, not nice and gory, um, chow mein type dish in a tin, and really, really sweet, lots of pineapple in it. We used to carry those, some rice. We'd, we'd buy vegetables in the villages that we went to, but that's generally what we had. We never took any eggs with us. We had powdered eggs, no milk, powdered milk, and we took kerosene to uh, power up the old Coleman lamp. Uh, a lot of you that have been camping in the like of know about these particular things, and they know that the silk mantles in the Coleman lamp are the, the, the bane of your life because you, you bump the lamp, the, the, the mantle in the, the lamp just turns to dust. So we had to make sure we took plenty of replacements of those along with us because, as you can imagine, if that lamp is in, a, in its box inside another box being carried up and down mountains and across rivers, the chances of a mantle surviving a day trip was uh, the odds were against it doing that. But when we got to wherever we were, we got settled in, that's what we cooked on, a little primer stove. I used to take uh, what's euphemistically known as a houseboy or a domestic servant with me, and when I got to uh, the village that we were going to, there was a house that had been built for the patrol officers to stay in, and um, all my bed was made up and my houseboy would get the, the primus going and heat up some water for a cup of tea whilst I'm carrying out my business with the, with the villagers. 
but uh, I don't know how many of you have ever been camping and used one of these. The five gallon shower bucket. That's a canvas bucket. And um, those people from Brisbane that, that know about the, uh, the drought that we had not so long ago and the courier mail was sending out little egg timers for your showers. The lax three minute shower. <laughs> One of those. If you felt that you needed to, to uh, have a luxuriant six minute shower, you just made sure that there was plenty of hot water on the, on the go, ready to top up the bucket again. But you would turn it on, wet up, turn it off, soap up, turn it on, soap on, back on, and you just do that until you actually had a shower. But you know that the, the, those boxes were all being carried on poles, long wooden poles, and uh, they'd just disappear into the bush and cut a few little saplings down and they'd use those. But those poles were not only just used for carrying the, the patrol boxes, but they're also used to build our beds. And that's called a, a tent sail, a bed sail. And it's just a piece of sail canvas that's been stitched up and they push a couple of poles through it and then make a bit of an A-frame, stretch it down and that's what we would sleep on when we were out on patrol. Um, in the Highlands I went out on a basically six month patrol. I went out every Monday morning at, uh, at dawn uh, get to a particular place, I'd stay there for the week and then at dusk I'd leave on a Friday, I'd come back to uh, Datari and I'd spend a weekend with Datari and then back out. I did that for six months. That particular uh, patrol officer's house was, was very, very cold. So I got some long grass, the grass that they used for thatching the roof and I stuffed it inside the, the bed sail there um, just to give it a bit of comfort, but at night time I get the primer stove and I light it and I put it underneath the bed sail and that heat would just go in there and warm up all of that grass inside the, the bed sail. I had to remember and turn it off before I got in the bed. I was like a spit roast in there. So I just put the, uh, the primer sail back, keep it nice and warm during the night. But to get to wherever we were going, we were always doing these strange things, crossing streams on, on the, the top left there. That's just a couple of little saplings that we'd walk across to get across the street, or Cane Bridge. Occasionally we'd use a little government work boat to move around, or on that bottom right hand side of a, a large wooden canoe that we would we'd move up and down the rivers on. But this is the sort of terrain um, that we would go through. People think that they, they watch the movies and they see people going off on patrol through the jungles and they've got bush knives and they're hacking away at all of the low hanging branches and everything. And that's not the case. In a true jungle, um, the trees are probably anywhere 100, 200 feet tall <coughs> and the canopies uh, don't let enough light in for for grasses to grow on the bottom. There's little shrubbery and stuff going on the, on the floor, but it's not as if you're actually struggling to get through. So um, the, the left-hand image, that is, it hasn't been cleared, that's just the way the jungle is. And on the right-hand side, you, occasionally you come across a beautiful little waterfall, so you stop, everybody strip off, jump in, have a nice cooling wash, get dressed and off you go again. But this is another image of, of the inside the jungle. There, that's up quite high, and there's like a moss and everything on those trees. That, that's about oh, 8,000 feet out uh, there, and it's um, a very, very cool alpine type uh, climate, foliage and everything they have in, in that particular area. But when we went from um, one uh, village to the next, we would, we would arrive and we'd say to the village that we're in, okay, we need to go to X village. So the, the, those villages there would get together, they would select the men to carry the gear, and off we'd go. Then we'd get to the borderline between this village and the next one, and we'd have to sit there and wait until the villagers came from that other village to meet us 
pick up the stuff to take back to their village. Because if the guys from this village had gone straight through to the next village, it would have caused no end of trouble. Because there's always conflict between the villages, whether it's because somebody didn't pay the correct price for the bride or whatever it might happen to be. So we always stopped at the boundary. We didn't pay the, the carriers from the village, we just left until the villages from the one that we were going to turned up. If you did that, you could be sitting on some empty patrol, bo uh, patrol boxes for weeks waiting for the next lot of carriers to come in and pick you up. So that's the sort of thing, <coughs> the terrain that we went through. But <coughs> otherwise, we were on, on rivers. This idyllic picture here, this is in the Rama River. And <coughs> this is the sort of village that we were going off to. Now, with climate change, that village probably won't exist in a few years' time because it's right on the banks of the, of the river. But that's the sort of river that we would be going on. Now, all of that greenery that you see there, most of that, uh, they're sago palms. You can't walk through there. You get cut to pieces trying to get past all those sago palms, or you have to go on the river. Now, to get from the bottom right-hand corner of the image to the centre-left, to walk it, you're probably only looking at maybe 25 minutes or so. But it'd take you half an hour in and out of water to get around all those, those uh, bends in the creek, the rivers there. <coughs> but the, oh, excuse me. <coughs> This photograph was taken from the track we were on, looking down into the village. You can just see the little huts in the village there. Now, the way they were set up, we would actually walk into one entrance into the village, because all round the back side of the village was planted up with uh, bougainvillea. Uh, we know in Australia, North Queensland anyway, they've got the white wild bush, white wild vines. If you're walking through and it jags into you, it hangs on to you. Well, they would plant all of that at the back of the village so nobody could sneak in. But that's, that's a, a typical shot from a track looking down into a village. Now, this particular one, I'm out on the walking tracks and they're actually clouds. That's not smoke from a fire. We'd just come from 10,000 feet down to maybe 9,000 to take this photograph, down to the village down the bottom there. That's where we were, we were ending up. That village is called Bamboo. We were actually walking above the clouds. Um, I'll tell you about working in that sort of environment a little bit later. But this is the sort of thing. Here we are again. I'm, I'm not flying anywhere. I'm standing on, on the ground taking a picture down into this village. You can see along the ridge there, the village, and if you look to the left, the left hand end, there looks like a, a large building. That large building in that village was that church. And it had taken me four, four and a half days to get from the coast to that village. These people had carried all of the sawn timber, the corrugated iron, everything else that they needed to build that very large church in from the coast right into this mountainous area to build the church. So that shows you the church there just in that clearing. Now I say okay well I do my thing, do the work that I have to do, hear some court cases, do whatever it was that needed to be done and then we'd stay there the night and move on to the next village. In this particular instance, we could stand next to that church and you could shout to the next village, which is way up on the top left-hand side there. See, there's a black line going through. There's the village up there. You could yell up there and say, put the kettle on, and about six hours we'll be there. Because we had to go from that village way down this ravine to the bottom, right in the the bottom across the creek there, at the bottom is a little, little bridge. There's a bridge on the right. We cross that bridge, 
and then we got back up the other side. And if you look on the left hand side, you see the zigzag pathway up there. As I say, it takes six hours to walk from that village to the one up the top. So it was quite, they were quite safe, you know, nobody could sneak up on them in these particular places. But um, whenever we went to various places, we were always welcomed by the, the village leaders and elders. <clears throat> and this is an image that I've, I found the other day. And this is actually true because it happened to me. It's not me that's in the picture, but this is being welcomed by a village leader. Now this cameraman was there and he'd gone into the village and he was just totally unsure what was going to happen to him. But in this particular area, that's a handshake. If you don't if you don't let them do that to welcome you into the village, then you're not you don't trust them basically. In that case you were uh, you know you've got to watch your back. But that's, that's a genuine handshake. It's happened to me, and uh, a similar occurrence happened to me in Darwin. The thing was, I was wearing my kilt at the time, <laughs> and um, we were at a, at a function with uh, a lot of um, Aboriginal people, and we are just generally chit-chatting away, and the next thing I felt this hand on the inside of my right thigh starting to move up. Inside. And because I'd been through all of this in Papua New Guinea, it, it just didn't phase me at all. The woman that was doing it, just about, she, she, she ran out of the place in complete embarrassment because I didn't budge. <laughs> but we get into the villages and um, we uh, meet the, the leaders. Now, we, we generally, depending on what we have to do, we would actually call in the villages from from elsewhere. So instead of us spending five days visiting five villages, we would go and stay in one village and call the other four villages in. And um, in this instance, the, the guys here that are dressed in blue with a, a red cummerbund and a, and a black belt, they're called Lulawais and Tultuls. The Lulawai is the, the boss of the village, the Tultul is his number two and they were given these uniforms to wear um, as a significant uh, so that when people came in they knew that they were talking to somebody in authority. And we call them in and I'm actually uh, handing out some uh, twist tobacco. Uh, you grow tobacco, you cure the leaves, put it together, get some molasses, put it in together and twist it really, really tightly and it comes out in in uh, sticks about 30 centimetres long and they're like steel. If you whack anything with that, they know. But we would actually peel these uh, strips of tobacco off and, and give them to the, uh, the uh, village leaders as a little bit of a gift from us having been there. But every time we went into a village, um, we would take carriers with us in there and we'd also um, take, uh, if, depending on how long the patrol was. I might have a policeman or two with me. I might have a, a medical orderly. There might be, well, there's generally an interpreter and a couple of other people would actually come along as part of the, the patrol. So we had to feed them. So in this case here, there's the policeman. Um, he's in there and he's actually buying vegetables from the, the villagers. And at this, this, this particular area that we were in, the very first um, European contact was in 1963. This photograph was taken in 1973. So they'd only had contact with, with Europeans for 10 years in this particular place. And were still using salt to buy the vegetables um, and fruits from the villages to, to feed the carriers and everybody else. But this area, in the Basavi area, which is in the Great Papuan Plateau, if you look that up in the, on the map of Papua New Guinea, there's a, a extinct volcano called Mount Basavi, and this is where we were down there. And these people down there, they're absolutely amazing. That house would hold anywhere between 150 <coughs> and 300 people in the one building. It's been built by them, not a nail, not a mortise and tenon joint, nor nothing. It's just 
uh, just uh, timber and bush rope and uh, kunai grass that they used to put on, on the roof. And uh, I'll explain a little bit more about... Oh, no, I don't, don't do that on the screws. Um, in this particular house, right down the centre, what they would do is that they actually planned for this, maybe five, six years in advance, they would go to another area and they would plant some trees that they knew they would use to build the house. And they'd plant them in a row. And these trees would grow, and over time, they would grow in the line, ready to build their next house. So when this one was to be uh, unused, they, they, they practiced a um, kind of gardening called Sweden gardening. And what they would do is they would go into an area, they'd pick an area, they would clear the undergrowth, then they would plant their bananas and taro and uh, pawpaws and all of what, all the seedlings that they would plant in the, the floor of the jungle, and then they'd just go and cut down all the trees. And so all those trees would provide shade, but, but uh, nutrition for everything that they planted, breadfruit and everything else. And they would just leave that, and that would just then grow up. And they'd forget about it. And then two years, three years later, they say, ah, this garden over there is ready. So then they would go off and harvest that particular garden whilst they're doing another one somewhere else. So they're continually doing this. But as the trees grow, they grow sufficient height to create this, this next house. Now the, the inside is as, is as high as this, huge. Isn't it? And they decorate the inside in this particular area. Any fishermen here, they, they decorate the inside with the vertebrae from barramundi that they've caught and the vertebrae are that big, just the vertebrae. So they're huge fish that they catch in this particular area, link them all together and hang them from the roof. But the men live in the center of the, uh, the, the hut, the house, and then there's, a, there's a, a bed area for a man, and then they have a fire pit, so they've actually built this little cradle, and they put uh, rocks in the bottom of the, the cradle, then they put clay on the top of that, and then they set their fire on top of the clay. So the, clay, the fire doesn't burn the house down, but the heat goes through the clay into the rocks. So at night time, that radiates back out. So when it gets cold, they've got their own internal uh, heating of the hut. So there's a man, fire pit, man, man, fire pit, so on, right down the length of the hut. The women and the kids are behind a wall that runs uh, down either side of the hut, and to get to, in, to see them, you actually have to go in from the outside. So there's no communication, connection between the men in the middle and the women and the kids on the outside. So that's just the way that particular situation works. Amazing, amazing people. So this is the sort of bridge that we would go across, a cane bridge, and that's all made from uh, a bush rope, and that can grow, you know, five to six hundred feet long, anything up to a couple of inches in diameter. Um, but this is um, used truly on patrol, and um, the uh, the guy with the beard in the background there is a Spanish film crew, and they decided to come and film us on patrol, so we're taking off, but we. Coming down the side of this mountain, all that track there has been cut out by hand, no machinery, and it's just uh, that, that track will have been used for the last, you know, five, six thousand years. People going up and down the, the mountain uh, range there to get down to the river. Now, at, at the moment, this is the dry season, so the river's not flowing all that fast and it's not very deep. So the carriers are coming out at the bottom there and they're just going across the river to get to the other side. Most people that don't want to get their boots wet will go, go, go across the, the bridge that's just disappearing over the, the side there. But there's the bridge there, and it's Cane Bridge. And um, one of the guys that was accompanying, accompanying me on this particular patrol was the council clerk. And he knew all about going across these bridges, but he also knew that a couple of people behind him were scared stiff about going on this particular bridge. 
So um, he decided to get onto the bridge before them. So he went across the bridge, and you can just see him coming into view. Now, he's just coming across the bridge here. He's in front. This guy with the orange shirt is terrified about going across the bridge. He gets to the end of the bridge and decides to give them all a bit of a hurry up. And you'll see him any second now. I'd say these guys are kind of scared about going across it. And he decides to bounce something down on the bridge. <laughs> Just to give them a bit. But that's all up in the Highlands. That was that was uh, in the, the last area that we were at. But when we first arrived in, in Papua New Guinea, I was uh, put in charge of uh, Manham Island, and this is off. It's about 13 miles off the coast from from a place called Bogia, and uh, that is the, that's the site that we walk up to every morning when we got out of bed. That was across the, the, uh, the sea from, from our house. Um, but uh, I said yesterday about the volcanic eruption in uh, the last big one, um, 1999 it was. You can see that huge hole there. When I was there, that was all solid mountain, and it just, you know, a massive eruption just, just blew the top off the island. But um, I used to go over onto Manon from the mainland on that little workbook you saw on one of the other slides. Um, and um, this was a, a beach that we would land at. But to get from the workboat onto the, the shore, we'd call in the first tender, number one group, to the tender, please. That's our tender. We get paddled in by the guy in the front, he was the, the boat's crew. Those two guys in the image there, one is a school inspector and another one's a teacher. And um, they would take people back and forth on the little dinghy to get them onto shore. Well, I decided I was going to bring 20th century technology to patrolling. That's not me. Well, I decided that I would take a motorbike onto the island and travel around and do the island in one day rather than spend three or four days walking around the island. So, clever me, load up the, the motorbike, fill up the tank with fuel, put it into the dinghy, lower it down into the dinghy with the help of the, the boat's crew, and um, I climb in the dinghy. Paddle, paddle towards the shore. What happens when the dinghy goes in front of the pro <laughs> of the ship? But a big wave comes on, wallop. And of course, I lost my footing and I fell backwards. So I, my knees, the backs of my legs were around the gunnels of the, of the dinghy. The motorbike was lying on my legs. The fuel tank for the motorbike's under the seat, so there's petrol pouring out of that. I'm under the water, petrol, salt water and everything else. The guy in the, at the front of the boat's crew he picked up the motorbike with one hand, his right hand, and he grabbed the shirt, in front of my shirt with his left hand, and dragged me out of the sea, threw me in the dinghy, got hold of the bike, paddle, 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 on the shore. And it took me about oh, probably 45 minutes to get the bike started, but uh, I decided that um, that would be the last time that I would try and take a, a motorbike on patrol with me, not on there anyway. Um, all my sunglasses, everything in my pockets just disappeared into the sea. And I can still taste that salt water and petrol in my mouth. And I'm just talking about it, it was horrible. But when we went round to the other side of the island, this sight greeted me, which is quite amazing. This is a 180 kilo dropper. And it was caught by the guy at the back there using four number seven hooks that he tied together like a grappling hook. And he was in his canoe and he was just paddling across the top of the reef. No bait on these hooks, just a fishing line and this grappling hook. And he'd just be doing this, seeing what he could jank. That groper, he caught the groper behind the gill with the hook, pulled the gill open. Of course, the groper wants to, doesn't want to drown, so it came to the surface and found this huge fish beside his canoe, and he very gently paddled back to shore 
keeping the tension on the line so that the fish would stay at the surface and not swim off. Eventually, uh, when I arrived on the bike, all I could see was this guy flailing away in the shadows, beating this fish to death on the shore. So I got a pole, and this is Manham Island, shaped like that. The guy in the front, the left side there, is a little seabed teacher. He can only be maybe this tall. The other guy is just about the same height as me. But the island is shaped like that. He is obliged, traditionally, to take that fish to the village chief. The village chief then cuts it up and divvies it out amongst the rest of the, the village and sends some of it off to the big chief, the paramount chief. So that guy is standing there and he had to go into the village first. So these two guys switch places and start to walk up into the village. What happens? The fish slides down the pole and that seabed guy's head disappeared right into the side. And I, I, you know, taking photographs and when the days of films and slides, if it was digital, I would have loved to have taken 100 pictures of this, but I, I just couldn't afford the, the processing costs to actually take lots of photographs of that happening. It was just so funny. But, like every, every job, we have work hazards. Everything from tiny leeches to large crocodiles. And this happened right through the time we were there. We encountered them all the time. And this is the sort of thing that we would be on patrol. There's the carriers and way in the background there. And we have to cross this sort of river. So what I did, I'd send the dog in first and say, off you go. Swim over there. See if there's any crocodiles in the river. But they, fortunately, there weren't. But we were beyond patrolling in the, the Ramu River. Now, you can see the, the depth of that bank there. When it rained further up in the mountains, that water would actually rise to almost the top of the, the bank there. But in that particular area, they um, in, it, this is maybe 300 kilometres inland. And in there, they've got fish of uh, a Uri Hay line, which means that they've converted from salt water to, to live in fresh water. They don't, not like barramundi, that they move back and forth. These fish have actually moved from the salt water and stayed and lived and, and become adapted to fresh water. And we're talking about bull sharks, huge sharks, and sawfish. You know, the long bill with the sticky out teeth. Those things, that I've seen sawfish bills that long in that particular area. But um, when the water would flow up, it would rise to the, these banks, it would fl fl flow over into the, the flat areas. And they form these lakes, very, very large lakes, very um, shallow lakes. And um, we were there at the end of the water lily season. You see those pink water lilies? Probably four weeks earlier than that, the whole lake was just pink, just covered with pink. But, you know, every time I was on an election patrol and I took these photographs, a by-election, and we went off on a, a bit of R&R, &R, a bit of Sunday recreation, to shot some ducks and caught some turtles and a few fish. But um, we, to get from the river, to the lake, there was all these little waterways, and was, we were paddling there in the canoe. And um, it didn't happen to me, but it did happen to a friend of mine, and that's gospel what he said. He was in the same sort of area on patrol, and you're walking in, in water, maybe just a little less than a metre deep. And these wooden canoes had come to pick them up, to move them to the next village. So he's climbing into the canoe, and he got his left leg over into the canoe, and he's got a nice firm grip on the, the floor of the canoe, and he pushed down to get his right leg in, and because his boots were wet, his left leg just slipped away from him. 
and he went down the edge of the canoe, one leg in, one leg out, and it hurt. And he fell into the canoe, and he took a few deep breaths, and wondered what's going on, and he sat down, and he looked down at his right hand, right leg, his thigh, and there's blood pouring down his leg. And he thought, oh, I've castrated myself. <laughs> Very quickly dropped his pants to make sure that he hadn't. And what had happened is whilst they were patrolling through these swampy areas, this leech had gone into his, his groin and engorged itself with blood. And when he dropped down on either side of the canoe, this leech just popped. And all the blood went down there. From that day onwards, when it cut back to the patrol post, he always carried a condom in his top pocket. <laughs> when he went walking and those sorts of things, he didn't want to have to go through the trouble of having a leech removed from a certain place. He'd <laughs> always, always put a condom on before he went walking in there. But um, when um, there's leeches and those crocodiles and everything, but one of the things that was really uh, amazing was that little fleas were a real pain. This this uh, old fellow here was quite proud of the fact that he didn't have any fingers or toes. He was suffering from leprosy. Really, really nice old man. But in this particular area that we went to, we patrolled in into this uh, village, and um, I set up camp in this in the patrol officer's house. And all through the night, I was scratching myself silly because all these fleas were coming in, eating me alive. And you get scrub typhus from free fleas, so apart from having abrasions on your legs and arms and everything, and I told the councillor there, I said, look, the, the, the hut was full of chickens when we first arrived. So I said, get rid of the chickens, get rid of the fleas before we come back the next time. Come back the next time, the chickens and the fleas were still in the hut. So the only way to get a new hut built was to burn the old one down. So we set fire to it and took off down to the next village and said, there you go, you have to build us a new one now. But the guy down the bottom left hand side, that's a stick of sugar cane that he's carrying around with the, the feed. So that's patrolling in there, there's the, you know, the little health hazards that we had. Um, we would patrol on, on the sea if we had to go to, we're on the coast and had to go to some offshore islands. This is a government work boat that would come down and get us and, and take us out to, to the islands. Now, we were involved in, not all the time, but we were involved in, in police duties, policing duties. So this is just a pictorial of policing duties. A uh, Lee Enfield 303 rifle and what? Uh, two, four, six, eight bottles of scotch. Yeah, that's a week's supply to one plantation manager. He used to drink over a bottle of scotch a day. He was there, um, he got evacuated just, just before the Japanese arrived. And um, uh, when he went back after the war, he was managing the plantation. And so he had the DTs, he was just a mess physically. Um, but he also had a 303 rifle and a big box of ammunition. And as the coastal traders used to chug along the reef past his plantation, he always thought it was the Japanese coming to get him again. So he'd sit on the veranda with his rifle and take pot shots at these lights going back and forth. And my job was to go out and convince him to hand over his firearm, tear up his firearms license, and advise him that he needs to take some health care issues. So that was great, not a problem. Stop shooting at the, at the, uh, the uh, boats as they went back and forwards for about a fortnight. And the ship came in, a little tender came in, picked up all these copra, dried coconuts, took them up to Madame. So he went up to Madame with it, got himself a new firearms license, went down to the shop, bought himself a shotgun this time, fortunately. So the shotgun wasn't effective over three or four hundred meters, three or three was. So the people that were traveling up and down were a little bit safer. 
but that goes to show you, you, you write all the reports you like saying don't give this guy a firearms license and somebody in the town doesn't listen. But we would do other things. We would adjudicate on choral festivals. You know, I'm not tone deaf, but I can't sing. But we would be the judges on choral festivals. We would do other things like we'd build little community centres and we'd have a netball court or whatever it is, so we would build those. That's the sort of community activity we were involved in. And I was a council advisor, so we'd do the normal, usual things, you know, road rubbish and rates, all of that sort of stuff, teaching the area that the, the third level of government, in my opinion, probably the most important level of government. Um, and they would have contracts for maintaining airstrips and other bits and pieces. The bottom <coughs> photograph is that they, um, I went down to inspect the airstrip that they had the contract to cut the grass. It's great. Yeah, the grass on the airstrip was nice and low and everything. But on the approaches, it was about this high. So when the planes were coming in, they couldn't actually see the threshold <laughs> that was supposed to land on. So we had to set fire to all that grass and clean that up. We would also get involved in building bridges. This is a, a Bailey bridge, all put together with, with a spanner and nuts. And it was all manpower moving the bridge across the river. They would build the abutments with these gabions filled with rocks and then they'd put the concrete uh, footings in and then they just drag this bridge across the river. And it was on a, 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 a seesaw, the fulcrum was the opposite bank, and the, the one side that was on the land, they would just have 44 gallon drums full of water to keep the weight on there, and they would keep dragging it. The further it went across the river, the more weight they had to put on the end, and it got tougher and tougher to drag it across the river. Once it was across the river and bolted down, not a problem. They'd take all the drums and everything off the bit that's on the land, dismantle that, take it along and, and bolt it onto the sides of what they just dragged across, and that would actually double the capacity of that bridge. And if they put three or four in there, they would go from five to 10 to 20 to 30 tons that could go across these bridges. The bottom two photographs are an airstrip that we built. You can't see it, but right up the back on the bottom left hand image there, there's a couple of little orange things. To build the airstrip, you can see the depth of the, the bank on the right hand side there, and clearing all of that dirt to make it flat enough for an airplane to land on. They had two wheelbarrows and 35 shovels. And that's what built the airstrip. I was there to supervise building some drainage, um, little herringbone drains to take the water off the centre of the airstrip and to construct a drain down the, down the outside edge. But that, that uh, airstrip is a three day walk from the coast up into the mountains uh, in the Sidor province. And um, the people wanted it. We had a survey to say, yes, it's possible to build it. But if you want it, you build it. So we would supervise the construction of airstrips. But we get on to things like other aspects of community health. And here's the, the death adder that I, uh, I showed you earlier. This relates to, we were on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And one Sunday, we were just sitting in the house listening to Grey Easterbrook on the NBC and um, knock at the door. Quick, quick, come, come quick, come quick. We lived opposite the hospital. Not a big hospital, it was four or five wards, mainly maternity wards and a bit of first aid. Nothing serious was going on in there other than childbirth. And um, the medical orderly rang across and said, come on, this man's been bitten by a snake. So I thought, oh God, what am I supposed to do? This is just after, not long after we arrived in Papua New What am I supposed to do here? So I went across to the hospital, this guy lying on the bed there, and um, 
what happens on the plantations in Papua New Guinea if a plantation worker gets bitten by a snake, the first thing they've got to do is kill the snake. The second thing they've got to do is take the dead snake to the plantation manager to show the plantation manager whether it's a venomous snake or just python. If it's a python, the manager do a bit of first aid, send the guy back to work, cut, cut some more coconuts up. If it's a venomous snake, then the plantation manager will organise for a tractor if they had one to take the guy to the hospital for some first aid. So this guy had been put in the trailer of a tractor and driven 20 minutes, right? been bitten, killed the snake, took it to the manager, check, check, 20 minutes to the hospital. So we're talking about half an hour at least has gone by since this guy has been bitten by the death adder. Then there's another five minutes getting me across there to have a look at him. And he's sitting up in bed. You could see the fang puncture marks on his ankle where this snake had bitten him on the ankle. And I looked down and there's this death adder cut in half and sticking out of the opened up death adder is the back end of the gecko, the last meal of this snake. So I thought, okay. Bitten by a death adder, better get some antivenine. Now in this hospital they had three uh, kerosene refrigerators for holding various things. Not one milliliter of antivenine for any kind of snake anywhere in these three, three uh, refrigerators. So that's another 10 minutes taken up rushing around trying to find out where this stuff is. Apart from the fact I had no idea how to use a hypodermic needle, or a hypodermic needle, as the case may be. <laughs> and so I had no idea what I was going to do with it anyway. So the guy's still like sitting there in bed. <coughs> you should be very, very sick or dead, having been bitten by this death hand. What's going on? So I got down and had a real close look at these puncture wounds on this guy's ankle. And what had happened is the snake had, had struck out horizontally, vertically with his teeth, vertically like that. And he'd gone and he'd gone through the skin, hit the Achilles tendon, and bounced straight back out again. And these snakes, they inject the poison bone, a hollow tooth. So it had gone in and out and squirted all the venom into the ether. Not one drop of venom went into this guy's leg. Killed the snake though, so he got got an afternoon off work. I mean, if it had gone a little, you know, a couple of millimeters further in, he'd be dead, no problem. That wasn't the funniest thing about this whole episode. <laughs> Standing there, telling the guy he's, he's going to be okay and everything, and the next thing, this gecko was inside the snake, jumped out of the snake and ran across the room, because <laughs> like the living daylight out of us. But this gecko was just covered in grey slime, you know, all the inside of this snake's in, the inside was starting to, you know, <laughs> dissolve this gecko, but the gecko, <laughs> fight the living daylights out of it. Well, that's the sort of thing that we get involved in from a community health perspective. This is what we would get involved in with, with uh, business development. So in this, this particular area, there's a crocodile, we'd set up crocodile farms, and I went to see this one run by a European in, in the Ramu. And it, all it was, it's a huge hole with a big concrete wall around it, and lots of crocodiles that had gone out and captured, caught, and thrown in this hole. And eventually they'd drag a few out, knock them on the head, skin them, and send the skins away. And I said, how on earth do you feed all these crocodiles? Because the pigs are very, very valuable. Chickens, they're not going to send chickens in. You know, like you've got the crocodile farm in Australia, they're always waving these big dead chooks and the crocodiles eat them. He said, I'll oh, come and have a quick look. He said, I managed to sneak these in. And we went around the corner and there was like a multi-story complex, housing complex for guinea pigs. And this guy had stuck these guinea pigs in the pack in Guinea and he was breeding them up like nobody's business and feeding them up like nobody's business. And he'd just go along and grab a handful of guinea pigs and throw them into the crocodiles. And, and, uh, and that's how he kept these crocodiles going. Um, but uh, 
you know, there were crocodile farms all around the sea, picking around the river. But we were bringing uh, development into uh, political development in Papua New Guinea, so there was always elections going on. And here we've got a, a, an image here of, of the vault taking place. Now, the polling booth is a little cardboard box on the table. I'm the returning officer. Call the person's name out, check them off, give them a ballot paper. You go around the other side of the, the uh, ballot box, the uh, booth, there's an interpreter on the other side, and we help the person fill out the ballot paper. Now in Papua New Guinea, um, at that particular time, the majority of people were illiterate, so the ballot paper, there could be 20 candidates, 20 candidates, and there'd either be a an image, a photographic image of the candidate, or a symbol that, re that related to them, and these 20 names and 20 little boxes to be filled in. One to 20. At that time, it was preferential voting, and now it's changed to optional pre preferential voting. We only have to vote for three of the 20 people on the list. But then, you'd say to them, oh, who do you want? Now, the men, they would stretch forward and start at the top, and they go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right down the balance sheet. So we would write one, two, three, four, right down to 20, give him the ballot paper, he put it in the box, and away he'd go. And then the women would vote. So the women came along, same process, name, check, point, ballot paper, round corner, who do you want to vote for? The women were a little less assertive than the men, and they start at the bottom of the ballot paper, and they go, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, six. <laughs> So we start at the bottom of the paper, one, two, three, four. So the donkey vote always won, but it depended on whether or not there were more men or women voting who got the actual vote. But that, that's the way uh, democracy worked in, in Papua New Guinea at that time, so it's a little better now. But um, on that, that patrol, that I was on doing the election patrol, I got a message through that I had to find this American guy. And um, remember the, the image I showed you of the river going through? All of that was sago palms, all swamp. You just couldn't walk through it. This American guy was going around that, that uh, river and he's going into the villages and he's buying artifacts. Now he was in those areas, they had, they had no money no coins, no, no, no money. People in those villages, they wanted to buy batteries, they wanted to buy a radio, they wanted to buy clothes, they wanted to buy other stuff, but they had no money. So the only thing they could trade was their artifacts. So this guy was going in, and he had a little, little boat with him, and he would buy everything. But he would pay 50 cents for everything. So the little kids were running around making up imaginary aeroplanes with little propellers on the front, and they'd be doing that to their 50 cents, oh, off they go. Dad would go into the men's house and get a 500-year-old, beautifully carved mast, or whatever, bring that along, oh yeah, 50 cents. So he would then take those back to America, and those masts they were selling for something like $300,000. So he was ripping them off good and proper. That shield there, that's my shield, I went on Google and checked the price of those there, that's worth about $85,000. Now, this guy um, was, was doing that, but he was saying, look, you build me an airstrip, I'll come in here once a month and buy your artifacts. And I was saying, oh yeah, great, we'll do that. Where are we going to build it? In the middle of the Sago Swamp. How are we going to do that? Cut down all the trees. And I said, no, so they was, he was basically starting up a, a, a cargo cot in these areas. And every village, he was telling him to go out and build an instrument so he could come in and buy something. So I had to find this guy and tell him in no uncertain terms that he was no longer welcome in Papua New Guinea and he should take what he had and go. And he never ever returned, fortunately. But he made a fortune out of buying these, these uh, um, artifacts from all these people. But this is a, another aspect of patrolling. You would have seen this on the, the Can We Help video that I showed you yesterday. This is the sort of beautiful little stream that we would go across. 
and we have to keep our ears open for uh, anything that's happening in the background in the, the mountains because if there was sudden storm up in the, the hills and these floods would come down the rivers, we'd be, have to be very, very careful where we were at the time. If you could hear it coming, you didn't go across the creek. You waited until it went back down because you could quite easily end up getting swept off into these uh, waterfalls. Kind of dangerous, some of those areas. You slip on the slippery rock and away you go. But I used to take my, um, my dog on patrol I took him on patrol when he was six weeks old, a little puppy. And we were running through the, the jungle and I'd be climbing over these logs and he'd be crawling underneath them. And um, uh, the dog, as I showed you, he went in the, the rivers to um, uh, check out the crocodiles. But he was a pig dog. Every time I'd go out on the motorbike to ver visit various um, uh, villages, he would come along and he'd run beside me. I'd be doing 20. 30 kilometers an hour and the dogs would charge along beside me. And he would disappear into the bush and the next thing I'd hear these squealing pigs. And he'd come out from the bush with a piglet in his mouth, closely followed by the mother pig and all the other piglets. And this little piglet probably died of heart failure. And I ended up having to pay the owner of the pig compensation because the dog had killed the pig. So, but he had a, a knack of finding pigs, the bad dog. And um, when we were on patrol, this is a, uh, when we got to the village, we used sticks to walk, but like people use these poles for walking. Um, and we, our boots would get soaking wet, so we just put them up there to dry. Now the policemen um, generally would wear their boots into the village uh, as part of their uniform. When they were relaxed, they'd take the boots off, and then they would wear their boots out of the village, and when they'd left the village sufficiently, they'd whip the boots off and just walk in the bare feet. Um, so generally on patrol, policemen didn't have any boots on, we did. Um, and then Papua New Guinea, they used these axes to cut down trees. Now, they don't cut them down at the ground level, they cut them down at waist height. So Papua New Guinea and waist height is probably about there and they cut these trees down these stumps. So everything from a huge tree to a sapling was about that high off the ground, roughly. And um, my dear old dog there, we were on patrol and he took off down the track and um, he'd unearthed this wild pig. So being the nice dog that he was, he decided to bring the pig back to his master. So he's chasing this pig down the track towards us. As soon as the carriers and the policemen and everybody else saw this pig coming towards them, they dropped everything and went up the nearest tree. I couldn't climb the trees because I had boots on and my boots were just sliding off the wet bark. No way I could do that. The pig's coming down the track towards me and it saw me. So the pig's heading for me. I'm trying to hide, make myself as small as possible behind this tree stump. The pig went around the tree stump, I went around the other side, the dog were after the pig. We ran round this tree stump for probably a minute. It's a long time being chased by a pig. Eventually I yelled on the dog and told him to stop. I ran past the dog, the pig ran into the dog, the dog grabbed the pig by the neck, held on to it, and I took off down the track as fast as I possibly could. All the carriers and the policemen <laughs> fell out of the trees like confetti, grabbed all the gear and they ran off down the track and the dog's still hanging on to this pig. And I gave him, I was about 75 metres away, and I gave him a whistle and the, the dog just went <coughs> like that and broke the pig's neck. And off he trotted down the, down the track after us. The village that we just left had heard all this commotion. So they sent some guys out to find out what was going on. They found the pig, held on to it for a couple of days until we got back and we had the, the, all the carriers and the policemen there and had this big feast on this pig that the, that the dog had just killed. Okay, tomorrow, those who haven't got Keener and Toya need to get some. This is the Keener, is the big shell that they wear in the Toya. Keener's mainly in New Guinea. The Toya's the uh, Papuan currency, it's a sliced up shell. That's what 
Aikina and Toya look like traditionally. They're the notes that you can, that you can get tomorrow if you haven't bought them already. But we had to change dollars and cents to Kina and Toya. So we went off on a patrol to change all the money. And this is me walking through the Tagara Valley, changing the money. Now, we went into one village and these two guys were having a big set to a real fight. So we managed to break them up and calm them down. And um, we had all these coins in this patrol, small patrol box, and it weighed a ton. And so these two guys, I said, all right, you're in court, we've got to go back to the station, we're going to hear the court case, punish you, and I'll let you know what it is when we get there. So we had about four days to go before we could get back to the station, buying all the, the or changing all of the uh, shillings and 10 cent pieces and 20 cent pieces and two shilling pieces, everything, to Toya. So there's a little patrol box that I say, wait a ton. So these two guys, that I'd arrested for fighting. Their job was to carry that box for the next four days. So eventually we got back to the station and I said, we fed them. No, I mean, we didn't just leave them there. So they carried that box for four days. I said, okay, you guys gonna fight anymore? No? Apologize to each other? Yes, okay. All right, you carried the box, that's your punishment, the way you go. So they went off to their villages again. But I left this picture in with the bridge because we, not me, I didn't build this one. <laughs> the guy before me built this. And he waited for the dry season, and they dug two big holes in the, the riverbed, and got a couple of empty 44-gallon drums, and they put two trees in, one in each 44-gallon drum, and then they filled it up with concrete, so you had these two trees sticking up out of these 44-gallon drums from a dry riverbed. Right? And then they thought, well, that's about the height we want it, so we'll chop it off there, boom, drop in a couple more trees in there, and build a bridge. Great. Bridge, fam fabulous. Drive the car over, no problems. There's no way the car could get on to the bridge. The track threw it down, but that's irrelevant. <laughs> Next thing, wet season comes along, whoosh, all the footings and everything go out from the bridge. Underneath that bridge, there's two trees hanging there with 44 gallon drums off the end of them and about two feet between them and the, the surface of the, of the river. So it's just unbelievable. Funniest thing you've ever seen. But we would go off on these, these special patrols. Again, this, this bridge here, that obviously it's not a permanent bridge. It would just get knocked down every time the, the rain came through, it get knocked down. But I was sent on a, on a patrol, a special patrol, this is Sidor. This map uh, relates to, um, that was drawn up for the Second World War. And uh, I'll show you this map again a little later on in another presentation. But I was sitting in the office, it wasn't all patrolling and everything else. We had to do uh, paperwork and everything in the office. And I was sitting in the office one day, carrying on writing reports or whatever. And a councillor came in with a string bag. And he walked up to the desk and he just went, <laughs> boom, dropped this string bag on my desk. Real heavy thump. I thought, what on earth have you got in there? And he said, oh, I found, we're making a garden. We're clearing the grass. We want to um, clear all this area. We want to plant some taro and sweet potato and stuff like that. And I found these. And I opened the bag. And inside the, the billum, there's these two mortar bombs. That big. And he just dropped those on my table. So in English that he could understand, I told him to go away in a hurry and take them with him to the other side of the airstrip. So he, he took these things far enough away. I went and saw the boss and said, hey, we've got this, this situation. He said, well, go and check it out, find out what the score is. So side door is where those blue arrows are. That's where we were, uh, the, the town is, the, the little town that we're in. And that X marks where the mortar bombs were. So we had to do a, a three hour, uh, sorry, three day patrol along the coast and then up to where these mortar bombs were. When I arrived, there were six mortar positions. Those positions have been set up by the Americans to harass the Japanese. Those red lines that you can see there, 
who were where the Japanese were supposedly retreating from Lai to Weiwak via Madang. So they, they set up this place there, they just dropped mortar bombs on the Japanese as they were going past. But there were six positions. They'd never used the mortars when they took them up there, but they weren't going to take them away with them when they left. There were piles of mortar bombs this deep, just all lying on top of each other. This villager had just about set fire to all the grass. And had he, there would have been no end of trouble. But we got the army disposal people up there, and we were sitting in the office inside or when they let off and, and detonated these six mountains of, of mortar bombs and, and you could hear the explosion from from that far away, say three day walk away. But this is what we found in around our area was the um, um, wreckages, that's a, a Betsy bomber, all around the area that we were in, in the dam. But again, so back to this, this uh, a better picture of the, um, the airstrip that we were building. You can just about see those two orange wheelbarrows up the back there. And, um, but that's how much dirt that they had to move to, uh, to build that strip. And this is my little hut that I lived in for the time that it was there. And uh, you can see the clouds up, up above me. Now, uh, this is a view from the hut to a little village that the people came from, that they were building this airstrip. Whilst I was there, there was a thunderstorm came through, and I was actually inside a thunderstorm. The clouds were right down through the hut, and when you got thunder and lightning going off, just outside your window, it was really deafening, quite frightening, and your body just shook with, the, with all of this that was going on. It was a most amazing feeling. But in that little village there, there's this little 13-year-old lad. Um, that's the village that he came from. And I'll talk to you in a, another, the Customs, Cults and Cannibalism presentation. This young lad here was, a charge, was charged with, with uh, murder and um, uh, per uh, performing black magic. So I'll tell you the story about the boy uh, in the Customs, Cults and Cannibalism. Um, but this, this was the 70 day patrol that we were on. We went to a place called Tech Tech. And um, this airstrip here, any engineers in here, 12% gradient, that was the airstrip. When you, they had a little uh, landing threshold, touch down, open the throttle, and drive up the hill to get to the top. Jam your feet on the brake because there was nothing at the end. Those little white cones you can see there, that's the end of the airstrip, to the right where those two guys are standing and just down into, into the bush. So that's, that's the sort of place we went into. But going up, I mean that, that airstrip was at, that tet tet um, was about seven and a half thousand feet. And I'll tell you about the Japanese War Graves Commission, guys that accompanied me up there in another presentation. But it was always great to get back home. This was me with, with our new son, and um, I wasn't afraid to change nappies. And we, we had a, a great time with our, our little boy there. But like every duty statement, there's always other duties as directed. Not written, but implied. So we would get on and, and do almost everything and anything. But in the, the hundred years that the earliest known patrol officers or resident magistrates or whatever, it was 100 years ago, the 1870s, right the way through to the 1970s. That's where we were involved in those areas there. During, I mentioned yesterday ANGO, which is the administration, the admi uh, civilian administration during the war. There were 313 patrol officers actually left being patrol officers and joined ANGO or the military. 313, and there's the, the honours that they got. There's a DSC, five military crosses, one, one uh, DF, uh, DS, DSC, DFCs, three DCMs, really highly awarded bunch of guys. Not a lot of them um, survived, 
and um, in the entire hundred years, there was only 2,000, uh, just over 2,000 patrol officers in the entire period of time. Now, there was a, they didn't tell us when they were recruiting us that there was a one in 30 chance that we would actually die in doing the job. The, the statistics for Australian involvement in, in conflict or administration, First World War, 15%. Second World War, 11%. Patrol officers in Papua New Guinea, 3.5%. After that comes Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and everywhere else. And we weren't armed. Well, initially they were, but we weren't armed when we were there. And we, we uh, fortunately, we didn't have too many people shooting at us either. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't a walk in the park, did that? Uh, it took... Um, it took 13 years of lobbying uh, the federal government to get a little 10% of our work, the policing side of it, to get uh, that recognised by awarding us the Police Overseas Service Medal with a TPNG Territory Papua New Guinea bar on it. And um, so it took 13 years of lobbying. Now, when we got that, I, I, the minister there, who's a Labour Party minister there, I said to him on the day we received that, what about a memorial for those 71 guys that didn't come home? And that was in 1913. Uh, 2013, I mentioned that. And we still don't have anything for the guys that didn't come home. So, fingers crossed something's going to happen reasonably soon to get all those guys that are still in Papua New Guinea. They never ever paid for bodies to be repatriated. <laughs> if anybody was killed up there, it's up to the family to get the bodies sent home. Um, so we're, we, I'm lobbying now. You've got a friendly MP in here that would like to see me later. I'd be quite happy to talk to the it. But that was that. Now, three o'clock, I'm in um, the blue room again for q and If you want to come and ask any questions. Uh, August 21st is uh, the day after we leave conflict islands, and Morag will be making her presentation, and I'll be making one the day after. So, if you want to stop us for a cup of coffee and a chat anytime, feel free. We'll see you after conflict islands. Thanks very much indeed.